SQLTips.com webcast. SQL Server on VMware Performance Optimization, presented by Joseph D'Antoni and Jennifer Joyce. I'm Jeremy Cadlick from MS SQL Tips and today's webcast host. As I'm sure everyone knows, VMware hosts mission-critical SQL Server applications all around the world. However, there are several, several configuration and design choices that can bring your SQL Server database to an absolute grinding halt. In today's webinar, Joey and Jennifer will tackle a number of these items, including how to balance your CPU usage between the host machine and guests, how to have a fault tolerant VMware environment, how to best configure VMware for memory usage, things like configuring VMware to give SQL Server the absolute best IO performance, and a whole lot more. Today's session is sponsored by Conducive Technologies. Conducive is the world leader in throughput acceleration software for virtual and physical environments, enabling systems to process more data in less time with Velocity version 7. Conducive has been named the first ever software vendor for the SQL Server IO reliability certification by Microsoft. They've also been recognized by Gartner as a cool vendor, and Storage Magazine has recognized them as the storage software product of the year. Gartner actually recommends Velocity for every virtualization initiative in your organization because of the reduction in noisy I.O. solving performance problems in virtual environments. With seven out of 10 customers buying Velocity for their SQL servers today at today's webcast, Conducive is offering a free non-expiring license of their Velocity version seven software to everyone attending. This is a $500 value. So be sure to check your inbox after today's event to get started improving your SQL server performance with no reboot and no code changes. In terms of housekeeping items, please keep in mind today's session will be recorded and follow-up emails will be sent to all attendees after the webcast to continue your learning. If you have any technical difficulties or questions during the webcast, please post them in the Q&A portions or if you go to webinar controls, and we'll try to have Joey and Jennifer answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the webcast. So please stay tuned. Joey, can you please take it away from here and help educate the community? Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. And and I see we have a lot of you in this session, and that's always cool because uh, I know performance optimization is a hot topic. Uh, today, we're going to talk a lot about VMware and, and a lot of VMware specific configurations. And in some ways, a lot of these topics are what not to do because typically as a DBA or, or somebody who's managing databases, you're going to have slightly different goals than your VMware admin is, is does in terms of what the VMware admin wants to do. Uh, and what the VMware typically is, admin's going to typically want to do is maximize the amount of virtual machines he, can, he or she can run on a set of physical hardware uh, to get the maximum value out of the software. That doesn't always jive with good performance, and we'll talk about how to detect that. So as Jeremy mentioned, I'm principal consultant at Denature and Associates Consulting. I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. I'm also a VMware V expert. Uh, you can find my blog at Joey D'Antoni. And if you have any questions for me that we don't get to, uh, just hit me up on Twitter. I'm at jdanton. So it's important to under understand virtualization and how it works, right? Uh, this is something that's that's a little bit of a black box if you're not you know a computer science major or gone way deeper into into virtualization than a lot of other people have and this isn't something that's specific to vmware this is kind of how all virtualization software works whether it be hyper v or even you know some container software all your devices become software abstractions that means your cpu your memory your storage and your network devices all become pieces of code that are running uh, in some software that's known as the hypervisor. That hyper hypervisor is, in the case of VMware, we call it ESX, and it's installed directly onto the host, that host being the physical server where you're running uh, your VM. And that does add some overhead because the hypervisor has to do some virtual machine management tasks. We'll talk about more about what it does later, but effectively, much like SQL Server in, in the SQL OS, which has a scheduler that schedules workload, it's got to schedule, take, take the, the workload that's coming in from the virtual resources and assign it down to the underlying physical resources. So it, it needs some headroom to do work. Virtualization also offers a great deal of benefit and flexibility. You don't really care what physical piece of hardware you're working on. One of the great benefits of it is you rarely have issues with drivers. Uh, and it's important to understand how this works and, and how optimizing your configuration can help you reach your peak performance for your workloads. We'll talk here today about patterns that 
uh, I've seen a lot of places and some indicators that will tell you, you know, hey, I think we have a problem or I think maybe our VMware admins done something where we've over allocated a lot of things and, and we'll, we'll talk through the scenarios here. So in general, what we're going to talk about it's a little bit more in hypervisors and what they do because it's a really kind of interesting topic to go down and it helps you have a good understanding of what uh, what's going on in your environment. It's not just your VM, it's, it's all the other things that are running and the underlying hypervisor software. So there's a lot of stuff going on and it's helpful to understand that. Uh, we'll talk about availability on VMware. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about both availability within SQL Server and availability within the VMware platform. Because there's some there's some interesting options depending on your, your recovery time objectives and your recovery point objectives. Uh, you might be able to get away with running uh, just on native VMware availability. It's, it's not a complete availability solution, but we'll talk through that. We'll talk about memory and allocation. As always with database workloads, memory is the, the most important uh, component because remember, memory is, memory is orders of magnitude faster than even really fast SSD. Uh, so the, the better our memory is configured, the better our databases are going to run. And then we'll talk about configuring for performance. And we're going to talk about there is a lead into what Jennifer is going to talk about is storage. And we're also going to talk a little bit about VNUMA, which is a, a topic that every now and then I see a really weird VM config and it gets affected. NUMA is, is kind of how your physical servers are divided in terms of CPU and memory. And we will walk through that in detail so you can have uh, a better understanding. All right, we're gonna start with a poll and Jeremy's gonna put that up. All right, thank you so much. So just wanna get a good understanding of some of the performance issues everybody here in the community is facing. So the first poll is how frequently do users complain about SQL Server performance issues? Constantly, weekly, occasionally, They've stopped out of sheer frustration or never. So if you guys could uh, please vote here, we definitely would appreciate it and we'll continue on with the session. Um, definitely know that a lot of organizations do face performance issues. Um, and there again, they can be very serious and things that uh, can definitely directly impact the organization. So just wanted to get a sense of some of the issues folks are facing. So if you guys could please complete the poll, we'd certainly appreciate it. And then we'll go on and continue to dive deep into VMware. All right, I'll give everybody about five more seconds and then we'll go ahead and close the poll. So I'll go ahead and close the poll here and share the results. And at 70%, it's occasionally, at 22% weekly, at 5% constantly, at 2%, they've stopped out of sheer frustration and 2% never. And I'd love to be one of those organizations <laughs> where it's never, that'd be pretty amazing, but uh, pretty cool. For sure. Uh... So one thing I, I, I want to kind of mention too, this is, I'm, I'm kind of talking about this topic from a, from a perspective of you're a DBA at a company and you, you're, you have servers that are running on VMware that you're probably hosting. One scenario I have run into, and, and a few of you may be in this boat, uh, is where your, your VMs are actually on, on physical machines that are owned by somebody else as a, like typically a hosting provider. There, you have to be really careful that those guys aren't doing some bad things. And I'll talk more about that later. And we have a little bit of a story from one of my coworkers. So like I mentioned earlier, hypervisors are installed on the host. We call the actual physical computer where, where everything runs the host. And they provide an abstraction. They abstract storage. So our storage is, becomes virtualized. This isn't necessarily true. VMware gives us options to map directly to raw devices, but that's typically not a common configuration. So what that means is your, your hard drive files are called VMDK files. That's a virtual machine disk uh, file. And you're gonna, you're gonna map to those. Uh, just about every software, every SAN vendor out there has you know, benefits to, to working with VMware. Uh, there's some concepts called virtual volumes that can give you some benefits by working with those abstractions. CPUs are also virtualized, so you want to configure the right number of CPUs to your, to your VM. We'll talk more about this later, but one of the common negative things I see in VMware is an over-allocation of VMs. 
because it can be, or, excuse me, over allocation of vCPUs, because it can be very easy to allocate additional CPUs to try to resolve a performance problem. It's something you can do dynamically. But if your database server or your server in general isn't using those CPUs, there's it's actually slower than if it didn't have them. So that's another important thing to note. Networking can be virtualized or it can depend on the physical networking. VMware has a, a component called uh, NSX uh, that is an add-on component, so not everybody has it. Uh, but you do have virtual NICs no matter what. That may map directly to a physical network or you may have a virtual network. Just an FYI, if you're in a cloud provider like Amazon or Azure, your network is all virtual. And all that means is your, your software defining your IP addresses and such, and, and they're not mapped to a switch. Also, memory is, is uh, an abstracted layer. So even though we have real memory on the server, it's passing through the hypervisor to get there. Uh, this process, the hypervisor, enables all the virtualizations that let you have uh, get your guest VMs on, on the host and provides other software resources for the overall process processing. So what that means is there's there's things like moving, uh, like VMware has a feature called D DRS, which is called dynamic resource scheduling, where a, a work VM workload can be moved from one physical host to another that's maybe less busy. Uh, or if there's a problem, which we'll talk about with availability later. Uh, those are all things the hypervisor is tracking. It's also tracking statistics. So you're getting, one of the cool things about using VMware is you have some built-in level of monitoring of things like CPU utilization, uh, memory utilization, and disk IO that you might not otherwise have. However, these things are not free. Uh, as we all know, and this is a bad cliche that I don't like to overuse, but there's no free launch in computing. So if we're, if we're, if we're counting stuff and we're running commands against the CPU, uh, there's a cost and that's other CPU cycles that aren't available to other processes. Uh, there's also some memory costs associated with the hypervisor. And, and one, thing I, one other thing I'd like to say here, just, and this is more for your own education, there are two types of hypervisors. Uh, there's one known as type one, which would be ESX. Uh, that's when the hypervisor is directly installed on top of the, the physical machine. Uh, so type one hypervisors are a little bit more efficient. There are also type two hypervisors. So I'm presenting to you from a MacBook Pro. We don't have demos, so you won't notice, uh, but I'm on a MacBook and I have VMware Fusion, which is the Mac, Mac version of VMware running here. That's what's known as a type two hypervisor. And the reason why it's called a type two hypervisor is it's installed on top of the guest OS. So I have Mac OS running, I then have VMware running, then I have Windows running on top of that. And type two hypervisors are less, less efficient. Just FYI, uh, VMware is a, a Linux based OS but you can run Windows, Linux, or whatever on it. Uh, it doesn't care. Typically, what you should do is reserve uh, five to 10% of CPU and memory capacity to allow for the hypervisor to operate without delay. And the way these things work in practice is that you have a cluster of machines, right? It's rare that you're gonna have one or even two VM hosts. You're probably gonna have at least three, if not more. Uh, typically, you want to run those at no more than about 70% overall resource capacity because in the event something fails, you want to be able to, to have a little bit of headroom uh, and room for growth in terms of planning. But that's really kind of something your, your VMware admin has to, has to talk about. So the real benefits of virtualization, you may be wondering why you have to learn all this stuff just to make your database servers run a little bit better because they're VMs. Uh, the, Honest thing is it, it kind of sprawled out of server sprawl. And, and I know there was a lot of this in the SQL server space when I when I started my career in the mid 2000s. Uh, you get more utilization out of your physical servers. So we used to have, we'd roll out a new server for each database and or each database services that were provided to an application and they wouldn't run very hard. And you know the, the CIO would say, hey, why am I paying for all these servers? And more importantly, why am I paying the power and cool all these servers that are running at, at very low utilization? So that's, that's probably the, the number one benefit is you're, you're getting more bang for your buck in terms of hardware. Uh, you get built-in high availability, and we'll talk about that on the next couple of slides, but you can survive a server failure. 
it's not perfect for database servers, but it's it's something that that you should think about and know about. Power and cooling savings. So I, back in a past life, I was a an principal architect at Comcast, uh, and this is one of the few pieces. And I always say this. I've said this probably in, in, in some real VMware papers that I've written, and it's it's not just a marketing spin, it's something I can truthfully say. VMware is the only software I can I, I can see, and, and hopefully Conducive can make this case too, uh, that pays for itself. So you pay for licensing for VMware, but given the consolidation in the servers and power and cooling costs associated with that, if we're taking, let's say, 10 virtual machines and putting them on one physical host, that's nine physical boxes we no longer have to power and cool. That makes a pretty huge difference. And, and you know, there's all the environmental concerns with, with running low, uh, less hardware. So there's a ton of benefits of, of virtualizing. And this is why it's worth dealing with the stuff we have to deal with that's a little bit different uh, in configuring. And like I said, server consolidation. This is really the moral of the story. The other thing I'll, I'll say with that is it becomes, your capacity becomes very modular. Uh, you can monitor the whole farm as a whole for utilization, and you can continue to add servers to your VMware cluster uh, so that you have more availability and more capacity. So uh, capacity becomes a little bit more predictable. So availability in VMware, uh, I, I want to talk about this. So VMware and, and almost all other hypervisors that you're going to run do provide a degree of fault tolerance. So if a physical host fails, your, your VM will be brought up onto another node. And I do have the asterisk here and on the bottom that capacity for the virtual machine is required on the target host. So the important thing about that and why I bring it up to a DBA audience like you folks is that, as we all know, databases love memory, and we tend to uh, we tend to want to give our databases a lot of database servers a lot of memory because it helps them run better, and, and they need it. And we want to buffer away that I/O. Uh, it's important to make sure your VMware admins understand as you go to you know 128, 256, 512, or a terabyte of memory uh, for your SQL server that you need to ensure that that capacity is available kind of in full on another node because in the event of a failure that vm is going to move uh, but it's not going to be able to come up if it doesn't have a server with that much available ram on it or it's going to be kind of a bad scenario which we'll talk about with over allocation in a minute uh, so so that's one thing to consider about availability another thing to consider about availability is that you're Operating system and your our, our relational database management system, so SQL Server, uh, are not protected from failure or patching. So you're going to have to take downtime to patch Windows and patch SQL Server. So obviously, what a lot of people do is use things like always on availability groups or log shipping uh, to provide a secondary copy of their database. One thing that fewer people do there in that scenario is ensure that those, if you have, say, two VMs in an availability group, you need to ensure that they, they're never running on the same node. Because like I mentioned, the physical host fails, your VM comes up on another node. However, it's going to incur downtime to do that because that's, there is, remember, there is no magic. Uh, in the event of a graceful failure, what will happen is your VM will have its memory frozen for a second and it will come up on, on another node. So that would, that would be kind of the case you would see with DRS. So it would quiesce the, the volumes uh, migrate the VM over. Uh, the, we can do this through the wonders of shared storage, uh, and that can happen seamlessly without downtime. But if you pull the plug on a host, that VM is going to have to come back physically, come back up, and do crash recovery and all those good things on on the second host. So you want to kind of ensure if if your availability needs go beyond with that basic VMware availability is. You want to ensure A, you have capacity for the VMs on another node, and then B, if your availability groups or clustering or whatever solution you're using, uh, you also want to ensure that you have what's known as anti-affinity setup. And, and that means that those two SQL servers will never run on the same box. I think that makes sense to everyone. One other thing I wanted to mention is that disaster recovery can be provided by additional software features. So in the case of VMware, there's a tool called Site Recovery Manager 
that is an add-on tool uh, to the base pricing of ESX. Uh, and it works typically, well, actually it works using SAN replication in conjunction with SAN replication. Uh, so all your transactions are replicated. A lot of folks that are in mission critical SQL server environments will still use availability groups for their database servers and let SRM handle all the application servers. Because just like any other disk replication based solution, when you come back up on the other side, having to perform crash recovery and all the things that you have to do uh, to get that server back up can, can take a long time with a database server. So a lot of times you're better off doing database level migration. Uh, this is something you want to work out with your, your infrastructure folks. I do know a lot of times the infrastructure folks, when they've invested in something like SAN replication or SRM, they will really push trying to use it for every workload. And if they do that, it's fine. It, it can work. You just want to test SQL Server with it so that you, you know how it works in a predictable fashion. So let's talk about over allocation. This is a virtualization problem that I see in a lot of places. And I mentioned hosting providers earlier, and they're always really bad about this because let's face it, if you're buying a VM from them, it's in their vested interest to, to cram as many VMs as they can uh, to maximize their computing capacity. You can over allocate RAM and CPUs to a given host. So for example, if you had a server with eight CPUs and 32 gig of RAM, and I hope you don't have a server with eight gig of RAM, eight, eight CPUs and 32 gig of RAM in 2020, because that's really small, but it's a nice round number for me. Uh, you can allocate more than eight CPUs for to VMs. So if you wanted to have 16 one core VMs, you could do that. If you wanted to have four uh, or eight four core VMs, you could do that. Uh, you can also allocate more than 32 gig of RAM, and we'll talk about how this works in, in, in a second and, and what it looks like. Uh, this can be beneficial in some scenarios, right? So if you're in, in those scenarios are never a production workload. If you have development environments or even testing environments where you know everything is not running at the same time, you can typically over allocate in those, those pools because you can define different sets of pools within your cluster. Uh, you could over allocate within those pools and be okay and you're getting more bang for your buck for your dev environment, which makes sense. The problem is that I frequently, frequently see this happening uh, amongst production workloads and, and it can cause really, really, really bad performance problems for your database server because Obviously, bad things are going to happen if you're going to if you're going to uh, do that. So let's talk about what this what this looks like. Uh, and I was at a client recently where this happened, so I, I had a, a pretty pretty good experience. And I'll walk you through what what some of the problems they were seeing. Um, so this is the over over allocated cpu scenario so this is where let's say you had eight cpus and you, your vmware admin allocated 32. when you've over allocated cpu uh the process the process inside of your vm is waiting for the vmware scheduler to grab a cpu cycle from the physical cpu and the hypervisor is waiting it's got a scheduler just like sql server does it's waiting to grab an available cycle. Since you've over allocated, you have uh, a lot of these. And in the place I recently saw this wasn't a SQL server so much as a Citrix farm. Uh, and if you're not familiar, Citrix is kind of a, I'll oversimplify it by calling it a remote desktop solution, but it's a little bit different from that. And this, in this case, uh, they were Citrix, they were using Citrix to publish a customer application to customers all over the US. And what happened was um, users were experiencing really slow load times on, on, on screens painting. And they were trying to see if it was a database problem. They were trying to understand what it was. And we were just trying to get metrics out of, out of the customer. And we were having a hard time getting actual data. But then as soon as we looked at this number in VMware called CPU ready time, uh, we saw a number that was 20,000 milliseconds. And that means every time uh or at present processes were waiting for about 20 seconds 
for a, a CPU instruction to be executed because they were they were not uh, they were effectively blocked because they had over allocated. So the fix to this was just to when we looked at the VMs, the VM CPU weren't busy. They were just very over allocated. So they had allocated a lot of four core VMs where they should have had one. Uh, and once we dropped the CPU count down and brought the, the cluster under better capacity, uh, the CPU ready time went way, way, way down to near zero. So that that's something to be aware of. Uh, if you're seeing a lot of SOS scheduler yield weights in your SQL server, and it doesn't really feel like you're under uh, CPU pressure, and if you're not familiar with weight statistics, uh, I recommend finding Paul Randall's weight stats script. Uh, SQL Server does a really good job of logging what it's waiting on in places. Uh, and this can kind of give you a performance profile of a server or help you identify any bottlenecks. Uh, in this specific weight, SOS, so SQL Operating System, scheduler, it's waiting for a scheduler. It's waiting for a scheduler to yield. Uh, as you can imagine, this leads to extremely poor performance for your VMs. Uh, one thing you should note too, and it's it's kind of buried in, in deep in VMware, and it, it depends on your configurations and such. Uh, but if you go beyond this problem and your your configs are okay, you may want to understand if you're using hyper threads versus cores. Uh, there are some minor licensing implications that are kind of out of the scope of this uh, talk around hyper threading versus cores. But you, you're not going to have as great a performance with hyper threading, especially post uh, Post Spectre and Meltdown, because hyper-threading was a lot more efficient when when they those exploits were in place, uh, at least on Intel chips. Uh, so that's that's something you should also be aware of. You can over allocate memory just like you can uh, CPU, and this can be even more unpredictable and impactful than than those than over allocating that CPU. What I mean by unpredictable is that the and these CPUs is usually pretty consistent. If you have an over-allocated CPU problem, you kind of always have an over-allocated CPU problem. Uh, memory comes in waves, especially if you have things like SSIS running on a server where it grabs a whole bunch of memory once a day and then goes way back down. Uh, so VMware, the way it handles over-allocated memory is by this process known as the balloon driver. Uh, and if you can think of a balloon filling up a box, uh, that's kind of what it does. So the driver reclaims pages from the guest operating systems via the drivers installed the virtual machine. So if you've ever worked on a VMware VM, you've probably noticed that there's something called VMware tools installed. That installs some low level driver software that allows the hypervisor to interact with your VMs. Uh, and what happens here is if you see, uh, if, if, all of a sudden there's memory pressure on the physical physical host and it can be from one or more VMs that are pushing the memory pressure. Uh, Windows or Linux will grab memory from the guest VM and SQL Server will have its buffer pool reduced. Uh, you can see this as wildly fluctuating performance. Uh, if your page life expectancy kind of looks like a sawtooth uh, where it goes up and then it slams back down, uh, and you have very variable query performance, uh, that would that would be something I, I would expect to see. Uh, so there are a couple of solutions to this. Uh, you can reserve memory, and really that's what you should be doing for your, your production database servers. And, and this is gonna come back to our availability thing ultimately. You can also use lock pages in memory. I don't like to recommend that because there are some other implications with lock pages in memory and it does some weird things in, in certain scenarios in SQL Server. Uh, but reserving memory at the hypervisor level for your, perform your performance or your production database servers uh, will guarantee you that VMware will not uh, take that memory away from you by the balloon driver. With, you're going to have to fight with that is remember earlier when I was talking about availability and, and memory resources. So if you reserve that memory, uh, so let's just say you, you reserve 500 gig of memory for your VM, that VM won't be able to start on any host that does not have 500 gig avail available in the VM farm. So 
because you've made that reservation, it can't over allocate. So basically what I'm saying is this is probably gonna cost your VMware admin money uh, because they're gonna have to buy more servers in the farm, uh, but it's worth it. You'll see way more consistent performance. Uh, it's something it's something you want to do, and that's called memory reservation. And you set that for each VM. So configuring high performance VMs, uh, don't allocate over allocate CPU within your VM. It's very important, and I mean obviously, uh, for those of us that work with SQL Server, we know SQL Server. We have to pay for it by the by the CPU core. Uh, so we kind of don't want to over allocate CPU anyway, because it costs us money. Um, but since everything is virtual, idle CPUs have a cost associated with them in terms of that scheduling process that happens from the hypervisor. So believe it or not, at idle, a VM with one CPU is going to be way faster than a VM with four CPUs, uh, because every instruction is going to have to process through those. Uh, it's easy to add CPU. It doesn't fix most of your problems uh, unless you're seeing a very specific set of problems. You want to reserve that memory. I don't have that on a bullet here, but uh, it's important that you understand that and you have that conversation with your VMware administrator because the balloon driver will wildly, wildly, wildly impact your performance. Uh, I've seen it happen a few times where everything's running great and suddenly it's terrible, then 30 minutes later, everything's running great again. Because remember, if you if you take away memory from SQL Server, as as the as you read pages back into the Power Pool, it's going to grab that memory back until the balloon driver claims it again. Uh, so this can cause wildly varying performance. Uh, and then configure storage and networking correctly. We're going to talk a little bit more about storage, but it's really important to have a really good uh, storage solution underneath you. Uh, whether that be a hyper-converged solution like vSAN or a SAN from a from one of the SAN vendors. Uh, VM databases love fast storage, and it, it's really kind of almost exacerbated a little bit uh, by virtualization solutions, because sometimes things that uh, might have been sequential I.O. coming out of a, a regular physical machine or, or random I.O. when you get to VMware. Uh, so, you want to have the right number of devices. You want to have the right number of IOPS, uh, and you want to. We'll talk a little bit more about devices, but we'll typically want to spread TempDB log and and uh, in data files, and then just ensure that your networking is configured correctly. And, and typically, what I mean by that is just bandwidth, uh, especially if you're in a in a solution where you're using iSCSI and you might be traversing uh, one network for storage and one network for for network traffic. Uh, you just want to make sure there's enough bandwidth on both of those because that can cause that can cause problems that look like they're storage problems even when they're not. So if you're not familiar with NUMA, uh, NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access, and pretty much every server made in the last 15 years has this configuration. And uh, I'm just going to go basic and talk about a two-socket server. So if we talk about a two-socket server, there's two processors and there's two banks of memory. Uh, the banks of memory are tied to each physical processor. SQL Server as an application is NUMA aware. So it's aware of the NUMA configuration in the underlying architecture. That means it will try to assign work to the CPU, to the CPU that's associated with the pages it thinks it needs from the buffer pool uh, in that bank of memory. So it, it knows where each memory set is. Uh, when we talk about virtual machines, this only becomes a problem when we start to make what we call wide VMs or VMs that have a large number of CPU nodes. So if you're if you're looking at most processors nowadays, you're probably looking at about eight to twelve cores per socket. Uh, so anything that's under eight to twelve cores, then it's important. This is one of the things where it's important to talk to your VMware admin and understand what your physical underlying hardware is. Uh, anything that's more than that. You're going to have uh, you're going to have to define NUMA within VMware so that SQL Server knows what it is, uh, and it's virtualized NUMA. Uh, you don't want to configure it unless you're spanning nodes. I've seen that scenario where an admin uh, configured it even though it wasn't needed, and that made bad things happen. 
uh, but it's really dependent on the number of cores per socket. This isn't so much a must-have thing, but if you have VMs that have a large number of vCPUs, this is something you might want to talk to your VMware admin about. So storage, like we mentioned, virtualization and databases are both storage intensive applications. Uh, realistically, if you're on-prem nowadays, I hope you're on a solid state array, or at least an array that has a lot of solid state drives in front of some spinning disk. Uh, if you're on spinning storage, uh, my condolences, you might be that person who's given up hope on performance. Uh, conducive software can actually help you with that, and Jennifer is going to talk about that here in a minute. Uh, but databases do a lot of IOPS. So depending on depending on your workload, whether it's OLTP or data warehouse, data warehouse will typically do a broader workload because you're doing those big aggregation queries. Uh, whereas uh, OLTP online transaction processing systems will do will just be really busy and do a lot of smaller writes. So both storage, bandwidth, and IOPS are important. So one of the things I, I like to say, and, and this isn't something I would necessarily say on physical servers, uh, but on v virtual servers, because you have virtual storage controllers, you need to uh, you need to split up devices so you're not overwhelming that that one piece of code. So the most common split is tempdb log and data, that's a pretty good split. If you have a few really busy databases, you may want to split up maybe in the log files of those. Because remember, SQL Server generally performs a, uh, IO asynchronously to the data file, but it's synchronously to the log. So those log writes can really hold you up. Uh, there's something I have on the next slide, but I didn't put on this slide. And this is the, the important VMware setting for uh, storage. All of your SQL Server drives that are not the C drive, because you can't use this controller for the C drive, should be para-virtual SCSI adapters. That's going to show up as PV SCSI uh, in VMware. And this is something you can change easily, and it will make a big, big performance improvement. Uh, like I mentioned, both bandwidth to your storage array and the number of IOPS that your storage can perform are important. Uh, it's important to know those metrics. So where, where do you look to monitor storage in SQL Server? Uh, so sys.dmos uh, virtual file stats, and I might have gotten that wrong, but it's if you Google virtual file stats in terms of uh, the DMV for SQL Server, that will show you the latency on each data file. That's a good place to start to see if you have a storage problem. If you're seeing latencies higher than 30 milliseconds, you might have a storage problem. You might also have an indexing problem that you can fix with indexing. But then you also want to look at SQL Server weights. And if you're seeing a lot of page IO latch weights, that's also indicative of, uh, of poor, poorly performing IO. Then you kind of want to look at perfmon counters like disk seconds per read and disk seconds per write to see how long those writes are taking. And if that all data kind of correlates together and is consistent, then you can make a case to your storage admin or your VMware admin that you have a little bit of a problem. The other thing to note, and this is just a general storage thing that I like to say, is I.O. can impact your CPU consumption. And this is really more of a, as a DBA, you want to make sure your indexes are right. Because if you're reducing the amount of pages you're reading, your CPU utilization can go down. And you can do this a few ways. You can use compression, granted that comes at a CPU cost, but you can also do it via, via indexing, which is also another uh, another beneficial way to go. Uh, more commonly than not, I see databases that are under indexed rather than over. So the best way to usually fix your storage performance issues is to create indexes. So in summary, uh, Right sizing your VMs is very important, uh, and over allocating CP VMs uh, with CPUs or memory will cause pain in your workloads. Uh, configure para virtual SCSI adapters for your storage. Uh, ensure your VNUMA is configured correctly, and like I mentioned, uh, reducing your I/O is the best thing you can do for your v overall VMware performance. And just remember, you want to keep memory in line with the capacity of the host. Uh, and with that, I will hand off to Jennifer. Great. Thanks, Joey. Really appreciate it. Go ahead and get shared out here. All right. So 
I really appreciate uh, that deep dive coverage, Joey. And uh, so just a quick introduction for myself for the audience here today. Uh, I'm Jennifer Joyce, and I'm the Regional Vice President for Sales for the West uh, here in Condu Conducive Technologies. And I've been here for about a decade, so looking forward to getting into some, some deep dive of how we can help accelerate performance in a Windows environment. Um, so real quick on who Conducive is, maybe a new name to some of you, but we have been around for forever. I'm still looking for the online calculator to convert software years into dog years. So if anyone finds it, let me know, but we have been out around for a long time. Uh, so 38 years old, and uh, we also have uh, a very unique position in our relationship with Microsoft as a gold partner since the beginning of their partner program. Uh, we are one of a handful of companies who have ever actually had access to the Microsoft operating system source code outside of Microsoft proper. Uh, it's really critical to a lot of the development of our own software that we are able to do. And recently, uh, a couple years ago, within the last few years, we were awarded by Microsoft the SQL Server IO Reliability Certification. Uh, it's quite an elite certification, very difficult to get, and we are uh, today the only software uh, vendor that holds this. Everyone else's hardware really normally reserved for the HPs and IBMs and, and that type of thing on hardware certification. So uh, we've got a lot of good company there. So I'm just going to jump right into the conversation today and really kind of build a lot on what Joey was talking about with SQL Server experience and how to improve this. Um, we have probably seven out of 10 of our new customers come to us because of SQL. Uh, and we we like to do a lot of surveys. And as uh, you know, Joey had done the poll earlier in the in the presentation today, uh, I think everybody's comments kind of echoed that for what we are hearing consistently in the marketplace, that 93% of organizations on average are getting complaints. And of those, between 25 to 28% of them are severe enough that it's set, you know, let's, let's sit up and see if we can do something about it. So uh, that's what we're here talking about today is how we can assist with that. Now, Joey made some really good points here. And one of them right at the end there was he talked about IO reduction being one of the most important things that you can do to help improve performance. And I'm, I'm going to take that a little bit of a level deeper as well in a couple of slides and talk about the benefits of, of having sequential I.O. along with less I.O. versus having a lot more I.O. with a randomization pattern. And that's really what we're looking at here. I realize that this slide is a bit of a rudimentary extraction. Um, you know, and of a virtualized environment. And Joy did a great job about talking about all the benefits, the cost savings, the environmental savings, um, VMware really paying for itself. Now, as great as virtualization has been for all of that efficiency, one of the biggest downsides to it is that it does add a lot of complexity to the data path, which I think Joey really did a great job of covering today. So this is really what an IO stream ends up looking like. And there's two severe IO inefficiencies that are really contributing to this, and I'll explain here just a little bit more detail. The first one is this Windows behavior. It's this IO characteristics that are much smaller and more fractured and more random than they need to be. It's kind of a, a little bit of a death by a thousand cut scenario. Now, the second one, the IO blender effect, I'll get into in here in just a moment. But what are some of the things that we can do to address this? One is throw more hardware at it. That's expensive and disruptive. Uh, it can also be premature. Another thing that happens very commonly is over-provisioning storage. Um, and, and I'm going to touch on the storage aspect here for just a second. One thing that is very important to have is to have the fastest that you can get, have the, the all-flash, the SSD, have the hyper-converged. But one of the things that's happening in the over-provisioning world is that we get a false sense of security. Someone goes into this environment and says, hey, I've got an all-flash pure SAN. I've got 100,000 IOPS rating on it. Why should I worry about reducing I.O.? Why would that be important? Here's why. Okay, so I'm five foot three and, and I wear flats. I own that five foot three proudly. So I walk into a room and there's a couple hundred people in it above capacity and someone says, your job is to walk from one side of the room to the other without bumping into anybody. And it's not gonna be possible because the room is so full. If I look up, 20 foot ceilings, there's 15 feet of airspace above me. That's my, my IOPS headroom. I can't use that. I have to navigate the space down here that's actually being used by all the other people. So the goal would be to have half the people leave the room and have the rest of them get into groups so that I can just walk right through the open spaces. What we're really focused on here is not how much IOPS capacity you have and all the over-provisioning that we have in these environments. What we're focused is on is the 10%, the 5%, 3% of the IOPS capacity we actually have that we're using. We want to make that go 30 to 40% faster. So what we're really focused on here is kind of not losing the, the forest for the trees with IOPS and IO response time, but we want to look at the big picture of what are our data transfer rates? What are our transaction rates going like? 
Now, what plays into this is to these two levels, the Windows IO tax and the IO blender effect. So I'm going to touch on the IO blender effect high level here, and then I'll dive into both of these a little bit more deeply. So with the IO blender effect, also, you know, AKA also known as IO contention, um, we can really understand that the workloads on server number one are impacted by the workloads on server number 37. They're all tied back into the same backend storage. And not only that, but you also have hypervisor level contention where the, the VMs on that hypervisor are also competing for the same resources. <clears throat> Case in point, just recently wrapped up a proof of concept with the financial services company up in Minnesota. And uh, they had their configuration done with six hosts with 120 SQL VM, SQL Server VMs on those six hosts. And they had all their app and their, their web servers off in a different cluster, obviously for licensing, you know, core licensing considerations, they had done that. Well, they had one customer on this one SQL Server that they were missing a monthly SLA on. And every month that they missed that SLA, they paid a $10,000 penalty back on that contract. And they had not made that SLA in over a year. So they were really looking for solutions. They found Velocity and we, we engaged with them for the proof of concept and they said, can we just deploy it to that one server? We said, you can, but you're not going to get the result. We can 99.9% .9 guarantee you that because of the IO blender effect, the optimization of the workload on that one server is going to be just fine, but all that IO contention of the small split random IO on the neighbors is going to hold you back. That's exactly what happened. We said, we got to have more servers. So the next month they gave us their 10 busiest workloads. Now we're talking unrelated workloads. These are all SQL servers, but supporting different clients. They gave us the 10 and it was enough. We were able to edge in under the SLA by three minutes. First time they'd made it in over a year. The next month the software was removed. They missed the SLA by five minutes. And the next month they went to this model and they deployed it universally, they made the SLA by 17 minutes. Now, given that they're a financial services company, their change control is extremely strict and we asked them to call back through their change control tickets and ask if there were any other major changes made during this four month period and they confirmed that there was not. Velocity was the only significant change. They also went back and called through their workloads for the time periods and the workloads were comparable. So the only major change verified was Velocity coming in and addressing this IO reduction. Now, here's, here's what it should look like, right? Now, this is where I want to talk a little bit more about the sequentialization of the I.O., not just the I.O. reduction. So it's very important that we get less I.O. That I.O., though, to be less I.O., because you're still transferring a gig of data, it's going to be larger I.O. You're going to have more payload per I.O. And natively, as this process takes place, the I.O. is also becoming sequential. And if you look at benchmarks at any SAN, any hardware, I don't care how fast it is, what its ratings are. If you throw a sequential workload at it versus a random workload, you're gonna outperform with a sequential workload every single time. So what I wanna talk about now is how do we do this? How do, with a 100% with a only software solution, how are we able to come in and, and make this happen? So a couple of things about the software before we go into the how-tos. First is where do we sit? Now the orange bar, that you can see here where Velocity is, um, is where we install. So we're installed right inside the Windows operating system. We are a set of a couple of mini file filter drivers, very lightweight. I uh, don't like to think of this as an agent. I think of an agent as being kind of a heavy load sitting on top of the OS, requiring a lot of resources. Not the case. This is, runs in the background as a Windows service on low CPU and, and uh, task utilizations. Um, so it's extremely lightweight. You would be very hard pressed to find it. In fact, it gives back more resources than it consumes. It's kind of interesting. Um, and then compatibility is the other important thing and kind of where it sits. So, you know, as you might think about this, you know, Windows, there's not a different flavor of Windows for Hyper-V or Windows for VMware or Windows for pure storage or Windows for NetApp. It, Windows is Windows. Everybody else has to be compatible with that environment, as are we. The only environment, part of the environment we have to talk to is Windows. So that makes us compatible with everything. So we can plug and play into anywhere. I don't even need to know what your hardware configuration is like. You could even be in the cloud and that's fine because we're optimizing Windows. And the most important aspect of this slide is really where we sit and that's at the top of the stack. So what that gives us the opportunity to do is where we are and because we're a 100% software solution, we are sitting there treating this issue at the source rather than everything else downstream has to deal with just symptom. And so we're able to alleviate and reduce 30 to 50% of all of the IO from having to go down to the SAN controller in the first place. And the IO that does go down has been literally transformed. And this is really the key is the IO transformation 
not only the IO reduction, but has literally been reduced and transformed from small fractured random IO to larger, fewer sequential IO. So that's kind of the, the keys to the kingdom there and how this works. Now we're going to go ahead and jump right into the how-tos here. We're going to go over the two major engines. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, manageability of the, the product, show you our management console, how it's installed, how you can test it and try it in your own environment for a free POC. Um, so, and then we'll also have a little, little time for Q&A here as well. So the right uh, optimization, this is called IntelliWrite. And if you think about this, uh, NTFS, it, it's file-based, right? And that's what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the logical disk layer where the, the files are getting logically committed within the NTFS universe. I'm not talking about the commitment down to storage, which is block-based. So we're two different universes there. Now, what's happening is that when Windows goes to write a file, it is missing a very critical piece of information called file size intelligence. It doesn't know how big the file is. So for example, if you have a 64K file inbound and the first available free space, it really looks for the lowest logic cluster number that's open so that first LCN that lowest LCN that's open it'll take that and it'll start writing that 64k file if the contiguous extent that's available there it's only 4k in size it will use it it will split the IO tie off and it'll continue writing and, and repeating that that cycle so looking for the next lowest LCN use whatever allocation is available split tie off rinse and repeat until the whole file is committed so it's one of the sources of split IO another could be misaligned partitions down at the, the SAN level but we don't deal with that. So at the split IO level up at NTFS, we can help address that and, and alleviate the split IO issue. And that's part of what we do. So when Velocity gets installed, we are feeding that missing piece of information, that file size intelligence directly into the Windows operating system and letting it know, hey, this file is 64K. That allows Windows to now use a best fit write allocation instead of a next fit. And that helps reduce the IO chop and it will create larger IO and it also helps sequentialize the IO, which is really what's getting that faster throughput for you as the IO is now has to, tr to transverse down to storage. Um, so you're getting a lot less in sequential IO going. So I'm going to move on to the second engine. This engine by itself, by the way, what this means is that 30% of the IO that would normally go down to storage doesn't. So if it was going to take 100,000 IOs to write a gig of data, and I've, I've looked at thousands and thousands of servers, it, it, the real numbers are around 137,000 to 154,000 IOs per gig is the averages I've seen over thousands of workloads. But let's just for simplicity, let's say it's 100,000 IOs to write a gig of data. Um, we're going to reduce that down to 70,000 on average. And that's a force multiplier effect. If you multiply that across every gig of work you're doing across your virtual data center or your SQL servers, it adds up. Now let me jump into the Intella memory here real quick. This is a second and separate engine, which is just as powerful as the first one. This is where we, we add in even more IO reduction through DRAM read caching. So what is what is this basically? We we could tier we, I like to call this our tier zero caching strategy. Now there's a couple of points I want to touch on about this engine because anytime we start talking about memory utilization and allocation, uh, people can start going, gosh, you know, thinking it's going to be capacity intensive, chew up a lot of memory resource, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So let me address those those concerns. The first and I think the most important thing and the real genius of this engine is that it is completely dynamic. There is absolutely no memory permanently allocated or reserved. The other really important part is that we leave a certain amount of memory free at all times. It's what I call the starting line. This means that you'll never, the system will never be tricked into thinking it's going into a memory starvation situation. It's not going to drop the paging. There's never going to be any memory contention. The software is designed to maintain and manage that starting line. And if we ever drop below that, that threshold, we're instantly releasing memory back. We're checking every second and we can release over a gig a second back. So we're never going to drop into that memory contention. Uh, we'll back off all the way if we need to. And then the other question is, is how much memory does it take to be effective? It's really interesting because it doesn't take a lot. Uh, most SQL servers have plenty of memory on them. If you don't already have a best practice of placing a memory limit on SQL, it is a best practice that Joey covered in another webinar we did. We can certainly uh, provide you with that information as well uh, if you don't already have limits in place. But the, what's above the line that's reserved for the OS and Velocity can use if it's free and available. So this net effect of this engine, and I'm going to get to uh, a little bit of our product dashboard here real quick, is another 30% of IO of the read IO gets eliminated. So what you're really dealing with, and this is a good, a good example of what the uh, UI looks like. Right in the middle there, you can see the combination of it wrote clean, it read clean, that 20 to 30% of IO reduction because it wrote clean, it read clean, plus the DRAM read caching, you're going to average 50 to 60% of all of your read IO eliminated. And then on the rights, you're going to average about 30%. You're also going to be saving an immense amount of storage IO time saved, which we'll also be able to show you. 
And in the deployment of the product is very straightforward and very simple. Um, it is a .msi, you do not have to use our console to deploy it. It is no reboot required to install or uninstall. And then the console, if you choose to use it, you can discover deployments after you've done them. You can also use it to deploy, and it will give you a very clean view, server by server, as one example in this one report out of this, that shows you, hey, uh, the yellow and the red, you may wanna look at adjusting memory so you can juice even more performance out of velocity. So very common benefits um, that we see across the boards. We've got uh, Chris's Health, for example, it's one of the downloads that you have for a case study. They came in with a uh, uh, 350 VM farm supporting their electronic health records. They were 18 months into their hardware life cycle looking at a $2 million forklift upgrade to recover performance. It was underperforming severely. They put us in, solved it, they canceled the PO. Um, and then now they actually run us on 2,500 VMs across their enterprise. A lot of other stories, but the typical takeaways that you can expect from Velocity are better application performance and stability, faster data transfer rates, reduced timeouts and crashes, just to touch on a few. In fact, I just was on a customer call two days ago on uh, shorter backups. They were running Commvault. They threw our software on their Commvault backups and it, the full backup went from 63 hours down to 23 hours. Now, how we go about this, uh, we will provide you with a free pre-POC pre consultation, the proof of concept, you can actually deploy it to every server in your enterprise if you wish, and then we'll provide you with a, um, a formalized executive summary after the proof of concept is done. The first step in the proof of concept would really be to look at the conducive IO assessment tool. This is the pre-POC assessment. This is a non-intrusive tool. Nothing needs to be installed on your target servers. It's just using remote WMI calls to collect existing perf perfmon data from the target servers. This will allow us to assess if your servers are even candidates and save a lot of time. This takes about 15 minutes to set up. You run it for a day or two and about a 15 minute review call. If at that point it makes sense, then we would move into the proof of concept. And we go into some of the best practices with you specifically on your environment um, if it's appropriate. So at this point I'm going to flip it over to Jeremy for a quick poll before I wrap it up. All right great thank you so much. Uh, so our poll is uh, please select all the free software you'd like to receive from Conducive. So a free Conducive IO assessment tool, free IO assessment review call with a Conducive engineer, a free 30-day Velocity trial, and a free copy of Velocity for one SQL Server. So if everyone could please take a minute to vote, we would definitely appreciate it. Uh, definitely thank you so much for uh, your information. Uh, Jennifer, definitely a lot of great information. Um, we did have a couple questions related to uh, the sizes of VMs or databases. Is there any information you can give us there in terms of um, what what type of capacity or what type of sizes is is typical that uh, or th th for conducive software? So conducive uh, is appropriate for any size. What we're focused on is the the optimization of the Windows operating system and giving capacity back to that system, uh, whatever's running on it. This is not necessarily SQL focused. It can actually handle any VM running in Windows running any application. So the size of it is immaterial, um, and we can optimize it. Okay, great. And there was another question related to being able to install Conducive on like a standalone server. Um, there again, is that possible? It is, and our software will install on a VM or a standalone server. And in fact, the free NFR that everyone can select to receive uh, is can be installed on a standalone server. Okay, great, great. And if everyone could uh, please take a minute here to vote, we certainly would appreciate it. Uh, there again, which uh, free uh, software would you like from uh, Conducive? So there again, we have an IO assessment tool, we have a call with an engineer, a 30-day free trial, as well as a free copy of Velocity for uh, one SQL server. So if everyone could please uh, vote, we definitely appreciate it. Uh, for folks who have voted, please keep in mind, we do have a number of handouts that are available in the bottom portion of the GoToWebinar controls. It's under handouts. If you basically click the arrow there, they should open up and you'll actually see uh, five uh, PDFs that you can actually download right now and start getting information directly from, uh, from Conducive. Um, we did have uh, some additional questions related to getting access to the slides in the archive. Just want to make sure everyone knows that today's session is being recorded. We will be sending out some additional information here uh, later today to be able to take a look at the slide decks from both Jennifer and Joey, um, as, and as well as be able to get um, a, 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 a review a copy of today's slides. 
Also keep in mind, Conducive will be sending out an email later today with uh, access to be able to get your free copy of their software, which there again is a $525 value. Uh, any other questions before we move on, uh, Jennifer? Or do uh, free to close the poll? Yep, I think we're good to close the poll. All right, great. Uh, this last 10 seconds here, if everyone could just please vote, we definitely would appreciate it. And we'll go ahead and wrap up. We'll, we're running out of time a little bit, so we'll just answer, ask a question or two, and then we'll uh, move on from there. All right, thank you so much, Ari, for voting. Uh, go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, so just kind of a last couple of comments here. Um, basically, the uh, the proof of concept, you, we would provide you an engineer to help you with this with that. And in fact, we just wrapped up one this morning, and I'll just close with these kind of comments because this echoes right back to what Joey was saying earlier. Um, you know, I just got a, a results review back on a VDI environment actually uh, running 330 clients, and we just reviewed it with the client today. Uh, the CPU utilization actually went down from 106 uh, gigahertz down to 82. The peak went from 22 to 17. The minimum CPU utilization went from 13 to 9. And this the workloads actually went up. It went from 800 gigs up to 1.2 terabytes. And it was really interesting because the engineer on this one who did the analysis said that the net result is that the velocity tool would enable us to run two times more workload on the current hardware that we have and up to five more times workload if we added some additional RAM capacity. And we could run, we were running 330 VMs, we could run an additional 325 VMs. And uh, it was so critical to them because right now they're actually in a position, as I'm sure many companies are of having to send employees to work home remotely and having to spin up a lot of VDI clients unexpectedly. So that's the kind of thing that our software is doing for folks. So Jeremy, I'll tie off on that comment and I really appreciate you hosting us today and Joey as well. Thank you for your incredible content. Thanks Absolutely. Everyone. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So at this time, we're a little bit over on time. Uh, I know we do have some questions. We are going to pass those along to Joey and Jennifer. Um, just please rest assured that I know there were questions related to getting access to conducive software and the assessment tool. So you will be able to get that um, get that uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, if you are interested in more information about conducive, Jennifer has a slide up with our website as well as access to their email and social media. So feel free to reach out. Um, at this point in time, definitely want to thank uh, Jennifer for, pre for presenting today, as well as to Joey. Uh, definitely thank you so much, Joey, for providing uh, all your technical information. There were a bunch of questions. We will definitely pass those along uh, to uh, to you. I also want to thank Conducive for sponsoring today's event, um, as well as your long-term partnership we've had. So definitely thank you very much for that. So with that being said, just want to thank everybody for attending today. Uh, this is Jeremy Cadlick. Have a great day, and please tell a friend about MS SQL Tips. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.